Well, grab your Bibles. We're going to go to the book of Romans. The book of Romans. Today we begin our summer series in the book of Romans. This is an awesome book of the New Testament, something I think that, I mean, I think we should read the Bible through every year, but Romans especially. I think every believer should read the book of Romans at least once a year. We call it a book, but it's actually a letter that uh, the Apostle Paul wrote to the church or the network of house churches in Rome. And the purpose of this letter that he wrote was to educate Christ followers on God's redemptive plan for sinful humanity and the transformational power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He wanted believers to be educated and to understand systematically what the gospel was all about. And so after his introductions there in chapter 1, he begins this treatment in verse 16 when he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes for the Jew first and also for the Greek. The gospel is the power of God for salvation. It is not some man-made philosophy. It is not just another religious system. It is not a political movement. It is not a national movement. It is not a social justice movement. It is the power of God for salvation. It is how lost people, dead in sin, destined for hell, can be restored in righteous standing before God. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now, when it says to the Jew first, it's not because the Jews are better or more favored, but because Jesus came to the Jewish people first as their Messiah. And they despised and rejected him and nailed him to a cross. And in doing so, they made him the Messiah of the world. Hallelujah. Not just the Greek. In the, in the original language there, the word is Helen. And it means non-Jewish speaking or Gentile people. It means that all people out of every tribe, every tongue, every nation, white, black, Hispanic, Asian, Arab, African, American, that whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. So what is this being saved? What is this salvation? Well, in verse 17, Paul describes it as the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith for the just, the righteous, shall live by faith. This is what salvation is. It is not you making yourself righteous by fulfilling all kinds of religious rules and rituals. No, it is God making you righteous, declaring you righteous through the righteousness of Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. This is the gospel, the good news in Jesus Christ, that we are made righteous through our faith in what Jesus did on the cross. And this is what the book of Romans is all about. Now, before you can grasp what this good news, this gospel truly means, we need to first understand the bad news. Everybody say bad news. And the bad news is simply this, the wrath of God upon the depravity of man. Verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. The true gospel, the biblical gospel, good news, gospel means good news, The biblical gospel begins with an understanding of the wrath of God. Now, we often like to start out with the good news. God loves you. You're his child. God has a wonderful plan and a purpose for you. But when Paul preaches the gospel here, he begins with the wrath of God is revealed against the ungodliness and the unrighteousness of men. The wrath of God. The Greek word for wrath is orge, and it is an intense 
sobering word. It means severe indignation, vengeance, punishment. Psalm 711 says, God is a just judge and God is angry with the wicked every day. That means that any description of God that only describes him as love, which is what we hear in abundance of today, but does not reveal that he is also capable of wrath, is an inaccurate, incomplete, even misleading representation of who God is. And he is a God capable of wrath. And what is the object of his wrath? Verse 18 says, it is unrighteous ungodly men, humanity, who suppress the truth in their unrighteousness. This is the depravity of man. Now, the word depravity means moral corruption. It means wickedness. It means that we all inherited from Adam, when Adam sinned in the garden and died spiritually, separated from God, we inherited that position, separated from God, and that nature corrupted by sin, that we, all of us, have a vicious bend in our will away from God and towards sin. We see it in Adam and Eve, especially after the fall. We see it in Cain and Abel. We see it in Noah and the flood. We see it in the Tower of Babel. We see it in Sodom and Gomorrah. The story of mankind is man's complete and total depravity, that we are fallen and we are corrupt by sin. And that this corruption, that this depravity that we have, has suppressed, it has dulled mankind's awareness of God and desensitized us, even blinded us to the reality of our Creator. Now this phrase, to suppress the truth, means that there is within every person a divine spark of truth. That God has created every person with an awareness innate of a divine being, a creator. Verse 19 says that what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. You can take the most, the most hardened criminal, you can take the most devout atheist, but when they get to a desperate point in their life, when they get to where they have lost it all, or they're, they're suffering, or their family is suffering, they'll often come back to that point, that core truth, where they look up to heaven and they say, God, if you are real, help me. This is a reality. They'll reach out to that friend, perhaps, that they have mocked for their faith, and they'll say, will you pray for me? Come on, how many have experienced this, right? Where, where people who seem to be atheists and rejecting God, when they're in crisis, they'll turn around and ask you to pray for them. It's true, right? I remember when I was just a couple of years in, into ministry, just starting in ministry, and I was driving on the way to the office, and I caught in my rearview mirror a car following me, and I recognized the driver. It was someone that I had known from years back. And in, in fact, I had known him in school. And in school, he used to mock me and he used to harass me for my faith and used to ridicule me. And I noticed that he was following me, that every turn that I made, he made the same turn. And every road that I went down, he went down the same road. And eventually, when I pulled into the parking lot of the church where I was at, he pulled into the parking lot behind me. I thought, I don't know what this guy, is this guy going crazy? Because this guy was not friendly to the faith, right? And I thought I was in trouble. And so I get out of my car, and he gets out of his car, and his name was Joe. And I said, hey, Joe, how you doing? What's going on? And he said, you know, I saw you, and he said, I, know, I knew I needed to talk to you. And he began to describe to me a tragedy in his life, a crisis in his life. And he said, I know that you know God, and I need you to pray for me. This was someone who had harassed me for my faith, who had ridiculed my faith, who was an atheist. But what happens when you get to that point of crisis and trauma and tragedy and loss? Every person returns to that, that, that question in their heart, that light in their, in their soul. Is there a God? And if there is a God, I need help. Amen? The truth of God, an inner witness that we all have. 
And it's not just an inner witness, it's revealed through external evidence. Verse 20 says this, since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made. Every time you see a sunrise, you're seeing evidence of God. Every time the seasons change, you're seeing evidence of a great intelligent designer. Every time you see the flowers bloom, you're seeing evidence of a creator. When the bees pollinate flowers, when an eagle flies across the sky, when a woman conceives and gives birth to a child, the intricate designs of the human body, the functions of the eye and the ear and the brain and the heart and the nervous system, system, none of this just happened. There is an intended anticipatory design in the universe that a big bang or random evolution cannot account for. Think about it. The earth is just the right distance from the sun. The atmosphere of the earth is just the right mixture of oxygen and CO2. The axis of the earth and the tilt of that axis and the earth's rotation on that axis at the perfect angle, its revolutions around the sun, the sea, the cycle of seasons on the earth, which are crucial to the earth's ability to produce vegetation and water and energy. They are all designed to support the life that God created and put on this earth. His invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so they are without excuse. All of it is proof that there must be an intelligent designer, a creator. But this is the tragedy of mankind and the depravity of man. Though we have this inner witness that there is a God, though we have the invisible attributes of God evident in creation around us, human depravity will always suppress that truth in unrighteousness and ungodliness. We're like a dog that can't resist digging in the trash. How many have dogs? How many know what I'm talking about? Right? I mean, you can train that dog, you can discipline that dog, you can feed it before you leave, but if that dog smells something in the trash, he's going to tear into it, yes? Right? I mean, you can try to put the truth in him, you can, you can hold his snout over him and tell him this is bad, if you do it, you're going to get banished to the backyard, right? But that truth that you've trained into him, will always be suppressed by his nature to tear into the trash again and again and again. It's the depravity of the dog. (laughs) It's the depravity of man that suppresses the truth of God in us. It's our default. And it doesn't stop there. Verse 21 says, Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Now, when verse 21 says that they knew God, it doesn't mean that they knew God in the sense that they had saving knowledge, but they knew God in the sense that they had a knowledge of a creator, of a divine being that they had that inner witness, that they had that evidence of of a creator all around them. But instead of this knowledge of God leading them to worshiping and serving and thanking God, they became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened like a dog returning to the garbage. Futile in their thoughts. What does that mean? Futile in their thoughts, hearts darkened. It means that their minds, and this is the depravity of man, That that their minds are overtaken by foolish notions and futile attempts to explain the world apart from the truth that God has put in their hearts. And to live their lives apart from the truth that there is a creator and a God to whom we must give an account. This is where so many scientists and biologists are today. They try to explain life without God. In fact, many biologists and and scientists, they enter the study of origins with a predetermined atheistic bias. They, They begin their career, they begin their study 
with this belief that there is no God. So God cannot be a factor in our explanation of the origins of the universe and mankind. So we must come up with some theory. We must come, come up with some explanation of origins that does not have God in it. It must be a big bang. It must be evolution. But when you point out the fallacies of evolution, the extreme improbability of a chance formation of DNA, or the absence of transitional forms in the fossil record. They say, well, maybe it wasn't evolution. Maybe it was. I know what it was. It was aliens. And we see this today, that this has become a major, a major factor in much of the explanation of oranges today, or, 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 oranges, of origins today. <laughs> where aliens have actually seeded the environment with their, with their DNA, right? It's what happens, and what happens now with these explanations is, is a darkness overtakes their pride and their ego, and a defiant hubris begins to grow in their soul. It is the arrogance of man. It is the depravity of man. Verse 22 says, professing themselves to become wise... They become fools. Psalm 14.1 says, The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And this is why verse 23 goes on to say that they changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Rather than acknowledging Creator, the, the Creator that we know as, as Yahweh, ancient man recreated God in his own image, in idols that were half man and half animal, half man and half fish and half bird. And they worshiped a false God that enabled and encouraged and supported their depravity. Rather than pulling them into a righteousness, rather than pulling them into a, a cleanliness and a moral code, it empowered and encouraged their depravity. And it's no different today. Now, we may not worship, you know, fish gods or bird-like idols in the United States, but we have certainly recreated God in an image that is more suitable to our depravity. Churches, even in the church, the churches today worshiping a God who is nothing like the God of the Bible. They worship a reimagined God, a God that is more palatable to our society, a God who has no authority, who has no laws, who has no truths, who has no absolutes, a God who lets you be and act and live however you want to live without any conditions. As long as, as, long as it feels good, do it. As long as it, in, it, it, it celebrates who you are, then do it. It's a false God. It's a rejection of the one and only true God who said this in Deuteronomy chapter 4, Take heed to yourselves, lest you forget the Lord your God who has made you. For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. And in many ways, we have rejected Yahweh, the omnipotent God, and we have created in our culture, an American God, a God of comfort and convenience who says you can live however you want to live. And the result of this is verses 24 through 27. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. For even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the, of the woman, burned in their lust for one another. Men with men, committing what is shameful, and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error which was due. It's what we call the judicial abandonment of God. 
the judicial abandonment of God. There comes a point in God's dealing with people, groups of people, cities, nations, when God abandons them. And the consequence of that abandonment is that they eat the fruit of their own choices. It can happen to an individual. It can happen to an organization. It can happen to a school. It can happen to a business, a city, a state, a nation, where God withdraws the restraining influence of his light and his truth and allows a person or a people to be consumed by their own depravity. Romans chapter 1, I believe, is among the saddest, most tragic chapters in the Bible because it demonstrates this reality. Look at verse 24 and you'll see a progression. It says, God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their hearts. The first evidence of God's wrath, his judgment on a people is not what we typically think of, you know, earthquakes and tidal waves and wars and rumors of wars. The first evidence of God's wrath and judgment on a people is the removal of his restraining force through the Holy Spirit and allowing people to follow the dictates of their own hearts. And Jeremiah says that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And it's the act of God giving people over to their own deceitful and desperately wicked hearts. And what you have is man abandoned by God to operate in his flesh without conviction, without controls, without constraint. Moral perversion, sexual deviation, pornographic images. Man's depravity becomes the accepted norm promoted by the masses, popular in society, and even provided by legislation and government itself. And it doesn't stop there. Verse 26, the progression continues. God gave them over to vile passions when the women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. Verse 27 says, Likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the women, burned in their lust for one another. Men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. This is talking about homosexuality. Let's be clear. But it's more than just someone who struggles with homosexual impulses. It's talking about, about a cultural norm where women exchange the natural for the unnatural, and men burn with lust for one another. Men with men committing what is shameful. It's when sexual depravity becomes acceptable, normal, a celebrated condition of the culture. And this is a sign of God having removed his restraining grace from a people as a judicial act of abandonment in giving that people over to themselves. Look at verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. In the Greek, the word for debased is adokimos. It means reprobate, without principles. And because reprobate and without principles, deemed to be worthless, having no value, and is cast away. The fact that our nation has adopted the entire month of June as homosexual celebration month is not a small insignificant thing. Are you hearing me today? It is a sign of where we are as a nation. It is a sign of a people from which God has removed his restraining grace. That God has given a people over to himself. And the collective consciousness of that culture, now hear what I'm saying, the collective consciousness of that culture has become a reprobate mind consciousness 
without moral restraint. And then verse 29 says this, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but look at this, also approve of those who practice them. We are seeing this today in our society, Romans chapter 1. The perversion in the media, in the government, the education system, the targeting of children in the public school system, there is a societal decay, there is a cultural hostility against God that is taking hold of minds of men and women. Paul called them, in 2 Corinthians 10, the strongholds of the mind. Arguments that take their place in the thinking, high things that exalt themselves against the truth of God, and we're seeing this in our culture. Listen, when I get a notice on my iCloud calendar that tomorrow is the first day of Homosexual Pride Month, they didn't say that. They said LGBTQ. We want to try to put nice labels on it. But it is Homosexual Pride Month, and all month, We have this messaging forced down our throats in our media, in our news, in our journalism, in our politics, celebrating how men want to have sex with men and how women want to have sex with women, and we are supposed to applaud this and celebrate it. Our schools are being covered with gay rainbow flags and trans flags and drag queen story hour in our libraries and gay propaganda in our kindergarten curriculum. And our president declares Easter Sunday as National Transgender Visibility Day. And our governor pledges legislation to provide hormone treatments, and surgical mutilation to children who want to transition their gender while hiding it from the parents. Romans chapter 1 makes it clear. This is a sign of a people, a society that is under the judgment of God. That the restraining influence of the Holy Spirit has been withdrawn and though that people They are under the judicial abandonment of God. Understand, there is such a thing as the restraining force of the Holy Spirit at work in the world today. In 2 Thessalonians, in chapter 2, it says the only reason that the Antichrist has not been released in the world today is because the Holy Spirit is restraining. And if the Holy Spirit were to stop acting as a restraining force, the spirit of the Antichrist would rise up with satanic powers and signs and lying wonders. There is a measure of the restraining power of the Holy Spirit that is active in the world today, convincing and convicting men and women of sin and righteousness and judgment. But there comes a point, in Genesis 6-3 we see this, there comes a point where God says, my spirit will not always strive with man. And I believe that America has entered the judgment of God. Judgment is not coming. Judgment is here. We are that people, in verse 21, who knew God, but did not glorify Him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. They knew God. Let's remember that America was founded with a strong biblical foundation. Did you know that the first official act of our first president, George Washington, after he recited the oath of office, his first act as president of the United States was to bend down and kiss the Bible as a public act of his devotion to the Word of God. 
John Adams, American second president, said, I have examined all religions, and the result is that the Bible is the best book in the world. John Jay, the chief justice who swore Washington into office, wrote, the Bible is the best of all books, for it is the word of God. Noah Webster, who founded the public education system, stated, the moral principles and precepts found in the scriptures ought to form the basis of all our civil constitutions and laws. One of the first acts of Congress was to import 20,000 copies of the New Testament, of the Bible, to be distributed throughout the 13 colonies. Abraham Lincoln's biographer said that Lincoln read the Bible, honored it, and quoted it freely. And some of us may remember, you may be old enough to remember, in 1983, when Ronald Reagan made this proclamation, quote, as President of the United States of America, in recognition of the contributions and influence of the Bible on our republic and our people, do hereby proclaim 1983 the year of the Bible in the United States. And I encourage all citizens, each in his or her own way, to re-examine and rediscover its priceless and timeless message, 1983. Fast forward to October 2007 when Barack Obama announced, whatever we once were, we are no longer a Christian nation. Now, what are you saying, Pastor Greg? That there's no hope that we're in this judgment phase of God? No, there's always hope. (laughs) As long as the church is present on the earth, there is hope for mankind. Because Jesus said, on this rock, the rock being the profession of faith in Jesus Christ as the Son of the living God, on this rock, Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. What does that mean? It's not talking about church buildings of brick and mortar. It's talking about you and me, people who have been transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ, who have been empowered with and baptized in the Holy Spirit, hallelujah, who now walk walk on this earth in the power of the Holy Spirit to declare the truth of God with signs and wonders following. As long as you and I are here in this country that I believe is under the judicial abandonment of God, the Holy Spirit, the power of God is still here in us through the church and wherever there is darkness the light will shine that much more brighter is there hope you better believe there's hope go ahead tell somebody there's hope there's hope amen there is hope hallelujah that's the good news that this gospel the power of God unto salvation for the Jew first and to the Gentile amen been made available to all people. So church, we need to be bold in our faith. We need, listen, the world today needs a church that will stand boldly in the marketplace, that will stand boldly in the places of media, that will stand boldly in academia, in the public schools, wherever you are, wherever God has put you, that you will stand bold in your faith and let the world around you know, I am a follower of Jesus Christ. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation for the Jew first and the Gentile, that the righteousness of God would be revealed from faith to faith. The just shall live by faith. Hallelujah. Let's stand together. Amen. Hallelujah. The local church is the hope of the world. It really is the local church. So be bold. This week, be bold. God, make us bold. Amen? Make us bold. I believe that one reason why that depravity is easily suppressed, not only in individuals, but in our in our culture, that depravity easily suppresses the truth of God because we who live by the truth are not bold. And we allow that truth to be suppressed around us. 
we become intimidated by it. We allow the depravity around us to suppress the truth that's in us. How many follow what I'm saying? We're afraid to speak up. We're embarrassed to speak up. Don't be afraid. Don't be embarrassed because I guarantee you that as you speak, the Holy Spirit is going to use you. It's going to start to speak to people around you, lost people that are around you. Hallelujah. God will speak through you. I remember, I remember, let me just say this, I'm going to close. Before I went into ministry, I was new, newly saved, I was a new convert, young guy. I worked in a restaurant washing dishes, and I witnessed, I shared my faith with everybody that I could except for one guy, except for one guy, because I told myself, this guy is just too depraved. He was in the homosexual lifestyle, he was into drugs, he was just, you know, he was one of the line cooks, and I just, I didn't really... I just thought he's too far gone. And so I never shared the gospel with him. Told everyone else except him. One day I'm in the back and I'm scrubbing pots. His name is Frank. Frank comes up to me and says, hey, Greg, can I talk to you for a minute? And I said, sure, what's up, Frank? He said, can I talk to you about your relationship with Jesus Christ? That's exactly what he said to me. I'm not exaggerating. Can I talk to you about your relationship with Jesus Christ? God was working on him. As long as the church is present in the world and we are giving witness of our faith, God is using that to speak to people around us. So don't be intimidated. Don't be embarrassed. Don't listen to the voice of the devil. It tells you you're going to be laughed at and you're going to be mocked. Be bold. Be strong. For the Lord your God is with you. Hallelujah. And if God be for you, who can stand against you? And if they want to mock you, let them mock. If they want to laugh, let them laugh. If they want to point... Let him point. Hallelujah. You have the truth of God in you. Do not allow that truth in you to be suppressed by the depravity in the culture around us. Amen. So, Father, help us today. Come on, let's pray. Father, help us today. Lord, as, as we look at the depravity of man around us, God, as we see a, a culture, Lord, that is going deeper and deeper and deeper, Lord, into sin, and ungodliness and unrighteousness. Lord, our prayer, God, is help us to be people of faith, people of light, people of boldness, Lord, who will speak the truth of God's word, God's love to the world around us. In the name of Jesus. Amen, church. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. Thank you for tuning into our service today. We're so thankful that you were able to join us. We pray that you're able to join us in person here on Sunday mornings at 9 o'clock and 1045 every Sunday. We also have amazing children's programs here in the building of Sunday mornings for both services as well. Wednesday nights, 7 o'clock here in the building, we've got amazing children's programs. And then Friday nights from 7 to 9 o'clock, we have our youth programs. If you want to keep up to date with everything going on, please check out our social medias as well as follow everything on our website at Mission Church. God bless you and we'll see you around.